Um, Skate Mom has a, a question here. Uh, and the question is, do you think the most important part of your art is the beauty of it or the message? Or maybe you can just tell us kind of how you see the proportion of the product of the creative practice uh, compared to actually like the act of the creative practice. Well, I think the way I see it is I think the beauty is what we're searching for and the material that we use just give it integrity, you know. Mm. So it's that, but basically like, I mean, I feel like our search is for beauty, like we're searching for beauty and we're just using this because this is what makes us feel that we're doing something on the side, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that beauty is what wants to bring people closer to see what it is made out of and find out what is it. Yeah, luring it's things. luring them in. Yeah, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Art Brunch on YouTube. I'm the host of Art Brunch and founder of the travel agency, Rick Bowling. Every week, live on Twitch, we bring in a guest from the contemporary art world to talk about their work with us at the leisurely pace of brunch. We upload past shows to Apple and Spotify podcasts as well as YouTube. YouTube hosts the art part of the conversation, so you can see which slides we're referring to while we're talking. If you want to hear the other segments of the show, uh, check out the podcast. Please take a moment to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And lastly, um, consider joining us one day for the live show. Uh, we have a really awesome community on Twitch, and it's the way the show is intended to be. You can ask questions, hang out with us. It's, it's a lot of fun. All of those links and more in the description. Our guest this week is Kelly Jimenez and Alejandro Franco. Kelly Jimenez and Alejandro Franco are both Colombian artists whose primary discipline is the use of discarded materials to create highly crafted works of art. You can check out their descriptions, their bios, in the description below. Uh, thank you for tuning in. We look forward to seeing you on a live show. And, and most importantly now, enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you had a nice little rejuvenating break. Um, where we left off is we were talking... Uh, yeah, I mean, we were just kind of getting into the the artistic beginnings of your relationship and, and some of the work that you did um, in, in, in different phases of the beginning of your relationship. So one of the things that I noticed in your work and I wanted to talk about was again about that interplay between interplay between you two. So previous to the break, we talked about, you know, this performative aspect and then this documenting um, process uh, as kind of how you first came together. But then one of the interesting things that I noticed, um, and let me go over here, is, um, so Kelly, you have done lots of textile work. Uh, and the image that jumps out to me is this one here, um, just because of the colors. I think I like I don't know if I like this one or this one better, but as far as like textiles go, I think this one kind of expresses more clearly the, these uh, these details and and this orientation of these various textures and and textiles. So you've you've worked in with textiles a lot, and it seems like that requires a lot of craft to to work with. Like it takes a lot of time to make any of these things. Is is that accurate? Yes, yeah, I I went to school for fashion design. Mm -hmm. I'm not into fashion, but I felt that I will learn like a lot of craftsmanship through fashion. So I started work I I went to school for that and then I started working for this textile company that is most for quilting. Okay. And actually the first time that I came to St. Louis was for a quilting convention. Oh. And that I, I knew about St. Louis and I, I remember that time I went to the city museum and to yeah. Lomire and I fell in love with the city and so working with this company I started like uh, doing art direction for them mm -hmm. they have like um, 
they release two lookbooks each month and I was doing the art direction for those lookbooks and then I I got hired for this this picture that you are seeing on the screen it's a music video so I was doing like the costumes for these kids that were part of the music video so it was yeah a lot of work it looks like it craftsmanship yeah yeah there is there's a lot of, of craftsmanship involved in that um and then so I wanted to connect that to uh if we go here let's see let's have it load um so if we go to some of alejandro's early work or maybe not early work but uh one of the th this is this is one of the things that jumped out to me because this bird theme continues to come up but we start here and with this this piece in particular it's uh a broken plate right and and it and it's assembled into what I think is is the form of the bird, um, but if, if any of that's not accurate, you can you can tell me. So then I see this work kind of in a a different space of like this is like a very direct action potentially of either finding a broken plate or breaking a plate and then turning that back into kind of like a realized form. Um, and then I wanted to connect <coughs> that to one more thing as as a as an entry point into your work together because then they come and this is this is recent stuff but then if you look at the collaborative work then we get to this place where you can see those ideas merge is that like there is this discarded or this like broken material but then also it's met with this extremely high level of craftsmanship that reminds me a lot of of these textiles so uh, I, I just wanted to present that to our viewers, but then also ask you if, if that's the way that it kind of evolved. Alejandro, did Kelly bring in a lot of this like high fidelity craft? And then like you're, maybe you're potentially bringing in these like alternative materials, but I see them really crystallize in this work as, as this merging between you two. That's awesome. Thank you for saying that. I think it's really hard from like our own sp own perspective to see those type of connections, you know, and it's, I'm really glad you are doing it and I, I'm noticing it now. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, are, are, is the, the level of craft that you all engage in with each other in these collaborative works, is that, uh, how, Alejandro, how do you see, because we know Kelly has this really deep history and potentially like arduous and super time consuming construction. Is that something that you've explored in your work or is that something that you've explored mostly with, with Kelly and these collaborative works? No, I explored it on my own as well. Like I really, that's one of the things that I, I appreciate the most in art making is craftsmanship. Yeah. Like, like living it at all. In the, you know what I mean? For some reason, that's something that I really, I really appreciate and I really like. And yep. going back to the bird, to the broken bird. Oh yeah. Bird, see, this is like that series that I call human resemblance. This is something I did at a art residency in Greensboro, North Carolina. It's mm. called Elsewhere Museum. And what it is is like it's a wonderful, magical place where it's a whole building that used to be a thrift store and it was closed for a long time. It's like a three story huge building full of amazing stuff from the 80s and 90s and 70s. And, and so you go there, so they turn this into an art residency. Mm. So it's full of stuff and everything that's there is called is considered collection. And when you go there as an artist to do the residency, you can only use the stuff that is there. You cannot bring anything in or take anything out. Mm. Wow. And they have so many wonderful toys and fabrics and things. Everything was beautiful. Everything had a vintage look to it. Everything was like so the type of aesthetic that I'm always looking for, right? But I'm always also trying to use what is the most discarded out of all. Yeah. So among all these wonderful things they had, they had a, a, bu a bucket of broken china. Because oh. everything they have is considered collection. So even the stuff that breaks, 
still have some potential, you know? Mm. So they keep it. They don't get rid of absolutely anything. Like sometimes you have like dust coming out of the ceiling and they will put it in these little containers <laughs> and, and, and label it, you know what I mean? It's like they take it so serious and it's so inspiring. So yeah, so to turn these broken dishes into flying creatures was like the most <laughs> fascinating thing that I could find, you know? And I, and I ended up doing like a life-size diorama and that's, this is just a detail of it. You see another bird. I don't know if you see it there, but I it's do. Got, yeah, I see that. <laughs> like little wing, wing is like he's like kind of picking his skin. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, when I met Alejandro, he was working in these animals for a show that w were made out of discarded materials, and the amount of craftsmanship that these animals had was amazing, and that was one of the things that I was like, oh my god, who's this guy? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, it's good to know that, because I can see the connection so clearly from the work that you do, Kelly, and into the, the craftsmanship and the weaving of, of those other parts, so it's really good to know that that's something that you both had coming in and then it seems like it just like went to a whole nother level like with with as we as we move back to these um you know collaborations like these these are like on a whole nother level of <laughs> you know what i think of as as craftsmanship first one we did that's the very first one we did and it are was so serious? much i mean we have the first one, yeah, is, is four four feet by four feet by eight feet. Unbelievable. I would be freaking out the whole time I was making that. If that was the first one that I was making, I'd be like, "What are we doing here? We are making something so special. Holy so, crap!" Yeah. It took us a lot of time. It took us a lot of time, <laughs> yeah. but. Well, started working on this was when we re when we just moved to St. Louis and that was during winter time mm. and we both mm. were jobless and we we didn't have a car it was winter so we didn't have anything we didn't know anyone so we started working on this and it was like a great time to to do something with so much detail on it where did the inspiration for Absolutely. beginning with stained glass come from for you uh, is there any is there any history that you have with that or, or did it have to do with um arriving in st louis or or anything in a way in a way that's like i feel that i always hated plastic so even when i used to work with found objects i would never use a found object that was made out of plastic okay mm. for some reason i always found plastic to be like a i guess the perfect archetype of everything that is wrong with humans yeah that that that, re that represents everything that is wrong with humans in a physical form is plastic mm. but when we were in st louis we had just moved here we had we brought very little very few things so we're in this tiny little apartment we didn't have any art supplies or anything and we just had all this plastic of the material of the like food that we were consuming mm -hmm. And that started to like gain potential as if it was the only thing in the house. <laughs> so we just keep collecting this plastic and then we saw that the translucency of it was really cool and the fact that it, it comes in so many different colors, you know. And also like the 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 typography or, or the graphic design that's that was that's part of it helped so much with like the like the painting process of like making these stained glass pieces. Like right now we have this wonderful palette of all these plastics that we have collected over the months. And it's so cool to have like all these different color plastics. So when you're painting, I mean, we consider this painting when you are like working at it, you know, you have to, you want to find the right, the right tone. Absolutely. So to have a large palette is so helpful. Mm. It's, it's so interesting because I, I like, right, you know, right anecdotally, on. I loved so that there was like, I could see that it was a schnooks bag, you know, from a St. Exactly. Louis perspective. It was like, oh, that's so fun. Like that. It's not just like a Target bag, which targets everywhere. Schnooks is only here, you know, and I'm, I'm so curious, like, um, how, like how, how, uh, how purposeful are you guys about that? And, and I'm also curious too, like if you were to make this art in any other city, would it mean the same thing? Would you try to find plastics of like local places to kind of draw that in? Or is, is that just kind of happenstance that you guys just happen to live here? You had the bags, you use your Schnooks bag. 
I think that, as you say, I think that happens very naturally, and is that's the beauty of it also, right? Yeah. The fact that it's locally, locally, it's got like all that all local local component to it. Absolutely. We just said because of the color, maybe probably we're just looking like what color works best and. Sometimes we try to avoid like showing the logos, but it's also cool when people are looking at the work and they recognize these logos and they realize like, okay, plastic is everywhere. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's kind of devastating in that way too, because I mean, you know, especially during the pandemic, like you couldn't use your reusable bags, which is something I would do a lot. And, you know, so there, I would try to at least get paper or something, but sometimes that's, they just have plastic. So I feel like I've personally been revisiting plastic bags myself and I, I feel probably a lot of people have too during this time uh you know when I, I i tried to not have it at all in my life and then you know everyone has that big collection typically that from what i understand like under under your sink of the big bag of plastic bags you know and um try to use them as like you know trash bags for your bathroom or something like that but um i i think like that's what was so stunning to me again just from the first time i saw it was um, not just so much of the like, oh, haha, look, it's a schnooks bag. That's so funny. But more like, I just think like the the devastation of it, like you say, but then also like there is beauty in this schnooks bag, in this material, in the fact that it's, you know, the, the red font that schnooks uses there of their graphic design on a kind of a tan bag, tan plastic that they tend to use. And um, I think it's just really striking that, I, you know, the idea that the brand identity on it would actually bring a whole new level to it as well. It, it, it like brings accountability, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, and that well, yeah. that brings us to uh, a question from GCAD in the chat. Uh, can you talk about your intentions for your viewers' experience? How do you want them to feel when they see your work? And is there a call to action for them? Yeah, I think. I mean, that is that is the call to action. Is like how much time we spend on this thing. You look at this thing, and that is how, in a way, that is like, um, I mean, it's an analogy for like how much needs to be done in order to have a better and more mm. sustainable place, you know. Yeah. So, so it's like, look, we are, we are, uh, we are invested in it, a hundred percent, and that should be like the inspiring point of like, what is it that you can do? Yeah. Yeah. To fix this problem, this is what's required. Yeah. That, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And and I did want to show the, the one um, image from this one at GCAD too, uh, because in in this one, there is, uh, you can kind of see with the, the pointer here, right in the, in the light blue, there's a huge Best Buy logo that's eclipsed by these smokestacks. Right, but like it is the full, it is the full logo, and um, like the craft is undeniable, and and uh, you know it's to to start to address this issue. I just, I really love, I I do really love that. I have to say, to address this issue, like to transmute the plastic bag, like the piece of trash, it, to transmute it into something beautiful, took you all what I have to imagine to be tens to hundreds of hours. And, and that kind of was a series of maybe like 10 pieces of plastic. You know, that is like a, a small drop in the bucket of the amount of that material that's, that's existing. Uh, so, so yeah, I'm just affirming here. I'm just affirming what, yeah. <laughs> how, how cool that I think that that is. Thanks well, for the questions, you can. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I also think it's so interesting to like think about value because like you said like plastic in some ways is the most evil thing in the world it is the mo it's the worst thing that humans ever made you know and our oceans are being destroyed by it i mean you name it you name it but like you guys have created this thing now that has immense value and it's it's it kind of has that like it is beautiful though because it's made with the worst thing in the world so i'm i'm curious about this like how do you guys source your stuff like where do you get your plastic bags from is it just from everyday life have people like donate given you their plastic bags i'm sure it's a question you get every time but just for the sake of this conversation um where are you guys getting your bags primarily or how are you rather maybe 
Well, at the beginning, we started like just saving all the plastic that we were using. And yeah. we had like, at, at, at first, we just had like a, a small box full of it. And then we started like just to walk through the alleys and look at in the recycle bin to see what we found. And Alejandro was doing that part. He, I was just with him. <laughs> and, <laughs> Let and him do the dirty work. work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we started by saving them. And then like a few people got involved and they started saving their plastic uh, for us. But then we just had so much. That uh, I had a feeling, yeah. <laughs> anyone. So right now we're just saving our plastic. We don't have any more people involved because we can keep up with the amount of plastic so that people, we have. People that were collecting it got super excited <laughs> because now they had a purpose for those things. You know what I mean? It's like, so they, it's so funny how they, and then we, so we went from like, okay, help us collect as much plastic as you can. That was like our first approach, right? And then we're like, no, 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 look, we're looking for like certain tones. Like we already have a lot of blue. We already have a lot of red. We're looking, if you find like, and then like the people, they were like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now they were saying, and then it got to a point where like, look, you guys are collecting more than we can create, you know, than mm -hmm. we can use. So we got every, everybody on a standby now. Yeah. <laughs> all day, all day. Guys, do Help. not send it, <laughs> everyone out there. <laughs> and we have, we have a, a great amount, but it's really good to know that these people are on a standby. Maybe one day we get this massive <laughs> project and we need them all to come back on duty. And right. It would be great to have them back, you know. Well, we'll do all we can at the travel agency to let everyone know. Like, hey, guys, Kelly and Andro, they need their stuff. Get the, get them get them their bags whenever you're ready, for sure. I can see that getting out of hand so quickly. Yeah. yeah. I think I think that, you know, what you, you nailed it in that, like, it gave people direction. It gave people uh, some, like, meaning they could attach to this waste. Like, I think that we we are all in this, like – somewhat like traumatized space where this anxious or, or trauma like space of like knowing that what we're throwing away is like damaging but our ability to combat that is like very very limited by in my opinion the corporations the corporate structures who are saving money by pr packaging things in plastic like there there aren't i cannot buy the items that my life requires not inside of plastic right um and and then we're all kind of dealing with this like social anxiety of like okay yeah it's going really poorly like things are getting really bad and everybody's saying like oh this is getting really bad and and even like ideas around recycling plastic have come up in recent times as something that's like of questionable value it's not what it was when i was in high school like recycle and everything's going to be okay it's like recycle and like maybe a little bit's going to be a little bit better but then you give somebody like the opportunity to use this anxious material in their lives to go towards this like beautiful greater good and then yeah i mean it just i can see kind of like this outpouring of people wanting to connect this anxiety or this fear that they have about the way that they're interacting with the world into something into something that's that's important particular plastic that we use which is like what they use mostly in like shopping bags and packaging material mm -hmm. that doesn't get recycled mm, i see they only recycle the thick stuff like the oh. gallon of of milk or uh -huh. like the bottle of coke i guess, or i don't know that. but this type of plastic they don't it, there's nowhere to go aluminum is recyclable that's why it's the canned crucible <laughs> not the 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 bottled gauntlet yeah <laughs> is that is that why you guys chose a can yes I, I love aluminum uh aluminum <laughs> <laughs> big aluminum fans i here. i really <laughs> i really do uh, all my paintings on are aluminum i have i just bought i just bought an aluminum wallet because oh let's see it oh, oh aluminum very cool yeah uh because like you can you can recycle aluminum really well cars are made out of aluminum so, you, you know, when a car goes to the junkyard, they just crush it and turn it back into, I mean, they turn it into cans, right? That's, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of what I, what I love about it. Um, I got a couple of questions in the chat here. Gregory Stevens 420 says, isn't an art gallery an STL that's owned by the owners of a single use plastic company? 
I'm not familiar with that. I'm not familiar with that either. Is it? Yeah. We need that team. Is yeah. this? Is this some kind of? Is this some subliminal <laughs> shunt on an art gallery that we're not familiar with? Maybe. Send I us the know. deets, Greg. Um, yeah, Greg. Uh, T Green Girl in the chat has a question. Oh, uh, Greg says I believe the Kransbergs. Oh, interesting. Oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> it's getting <We're> <laughs> It's getting spicy. We're getting spicy in here for certain drama. <laughs> We're not avoiding conflict. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny. We we don't know. We don't have the facts. So. Um, but, but yeah, I think that's something we'll, to look we'll, into. We'll, 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 yeah. <laughs> we'll look into it for sure. Yeah. Because I mean, especially in, in the arts, like we, we do need to hold each other accountable. I mean, I don't know what, you know, we're not the ones who are making the big, like physical societal changes, but if we're not living by morality, <laughs> that's, yeah. you know, what, what the hell are we doing? Great. Greg says, I'm an Aries. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Typical uh, Aries. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> I, I've got a question from T Green Girl here. Um, she says, I hopped in a little late, but I'm curious. How thick is the plastic when they're in the window? Curious if it's still malleable or if it's melted into something thicker? Hmm. No, it's, it's glue. It's glue to paper. Okay. So this particular window that you're seeing is outdoors. So because it's outdoors, it's got two plexiglass on each sandwich between two plexiglass so that it can withstand the elements. Mm. So the, like this one is, is attached to that, one, to... that one is just plastic glue onto paper. Oh, because so it's the first one. Yeah, <laughs> too. Yeah. Lots of learning so the there. Black, but the it's black strong. lines, the stroke, uh -huh. paper. Oh, okay. Paper. Okay. Oh, I see. Wonderful. Got you. Um, oh, and, and, we right. got some. We got some hot drama in the chat here. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, Ken Kranzberg serves as the chairman of Trico Braun, the industry's largest distributor and designer of glass and plastic containers. Former president and chairman of the National Association of Container Distributors. Hmm. So, what's up, NCAD? Is it an email or something? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I I mean, I, I think we'll, it's interesting. <laughs> What's that? We'll spread the drama. We'll we'll share the tea after for sure. We'll get we'll get hot links out there for everyone. Thanks for the research. Um, yeah. Well, and I just have a question for you guys, and we don't have to keep talking about the materials the whole time, even though it's it is so special to talk about. Is like you know I, at first like I'm kind of thinking like, oh like well like they would have to become basically like their own like mini recycling, you know, space. Like everyone's going to bring them all their bags and then they have their own mountain. And it's like, well, it's unfair for them to have to deal with all of that material. But then I was thinking, I was like, well, at the same time, like any artist that works with a physical medium, you know, or like, I, I mean, I'm a photographer, like I use film. Film is like, uh, it is, it is a filament. It's, I actually found out recently that there's an ingredient in it that actually requires like animal fat so it's technically like not vegetarian or a vegan material which i had never once thought about i've been vegetarian for like 12 or 13 years now so i'm like well so who's gonna come out with a vegan film at some point maybe that's my ten thousand dollar idea no one steal it copyright jake leach anyway but like at vegan film on instagram yes <laughs> it's already taken thank you um but like <laughs> You know, I'm thinking about, like, how many – I'm like, Rick, I imagine you have a bunch of materials that, like, you have to scrap or throw away or stuff that you just – if for nothing else, just hold on to for years. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like it would, it's doing more for me, and this is more of an open-ended statement of, like, really reconsidering what materials I do use and why I hold on to them and which materials am I just deciding to get rid of. Or, you know, the, the use of the plastic is, is still using it, but you guys have created something of worth. You know, so I, I just I feel like I've, I'm I'm going to have to think a lot about what we're talking about here. But but and like, Rick, I'm just curious for your practice, like what like what materials have you used that maybe speaks to you in this way of like think, considering your waste as a more physical artist? Yeah, I, I made a series of works um, based on the waste of from my studio and uh, old like found latex house paint. So I was creating these like um, massive like plastic and cardboard 
latex paint like boogers as kind of what they ended up being is they just started to kind of congeal into all of these different ways um and i was uh i was like spraying them with febreze and i don't know it was early art school it was it, it was it was interesting so so yeah i mean in environmentally go ahead why febreze just to make like it was uh just this idea of like covering up like covering up the smell like making it all all homogenous and making it smell fresh and clean but it it was like rotting food and like uh old nasty latex paint and i actually hate the smell of febreze but i <laughs> i wanted to just like i made the whole like studio complex smell like febreze cuz i was spraying it just like all the time you walk by my studio and you're like oh that's where that's coming from it's febreze guy yeah um so yeah yeah i mean there's that i i think i think i i consider that a lot with my current work and um there are some environmental issues with the type of paint that i use like uh the enamel that i use and and having it um come from spray cans uh but then um i'm making the transition in my practice to shooting paint through uh, a spray gun which just uses compressed air and doesn't have the same kind of um, like chemicals that you need to compress something into a spray can um, but then yeah the aluminum the aluminum is recyclable uh, and I, I also just love I love like the idea of scrapping like scrappers um, and I feel like artists are really not so much different than scrappers and there's like a lot of <laughs> crossover of like finding discarded objects from the world that don't have enough value for somebody to, you know, to save or to haul to the, the scrapyard. But like, you can make money if you just go out and collect cans. Like that's, right. that's money just like laying all over the ground. Mm. No, very bit of money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a little bit. Pay but for your coffee maybe. For some people though, I mean, they, 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 you know, live with different, proportions and they live in, right. in 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 different ways of interfacing with the world and and that is real money right um we've got a couple of things so yeah definitely popping off against the cransbergs in the chat so um <laughs> skate mom says i had this idea that let me see what i i really liked what she said uh I actually don't see it right now, but something to the effect of like, I'm typically under the assumption that artists are environmentalists and it just isn't always the case. Yeah. Which is a good reminder. It's like, just because someone's in, in invested or, you know, working inside of the arts doesn't mean that there aren't alternate types of accountability that they need. Um, what else we got? Uh, Denise in the chat says, I saw your globe and map made out of bags at, the GCAT exhibit and was blown away by how visceral and immediate the message was conveyed by the medium. Such a perfect combination. Thank you for sharing your create creativity and expertise. What are you working on next? Oh. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, right now we're making small pieces because we just have all this paper that we had bought, which is like 16 by 20 pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. And we're just like turning those into small pieces that are a size that could be sellable. Mm. And we just put together this application. We like have this really cool project where you see that piece that is like an anatomy piece of a cow. Oh, yeah. So we're building up on that. We have like a whole anatomy show that we're, that we're planning and we're just looking for the right place to show it. And so that, that could be next. And that, that's also a common thing that people discuss is um, the uh, microplastics inside of fish is, is where I see it. What it. That's what this work has to do with. Okay. Plastic permeating every single part of, of this existence, you know, and like into bodies and into the, and chain, in, food. Into the chain food, into plants, into everything, you know. Mm. So then we're going to be at one point genetically modified by the existence of plastic, you know, because it doesn't go anywhere. It just becomes tiny little microplastic particles that keep on going into every single place where they where they can go, you know. Absolutely. Well, and I'm just curious really quick about how you guys do this because I'll notice, like, when I'm in a store and I'll see a product that, like, 
it's like this was made with 15 20 30 percent of recycled materials and i will look at that and be like oh well it's only 15 it's only 30 percent recycled materials okay and then i'll almost judge that harder even though that company tried they did something to make it better then the company right next to it like i'm thinking about toothbrushes i recently bought a toothbrush where the handle was made of recycled plastic and the idea was is that it, once the head of it gets kind of old, you can buy a new replacement head. And it's the same handle, and the amount of plastic you're, you're throwing away or trying to recycle is, like, this big as opposed to this big, you know? And I, I found that, like, I was judging this material that was actually doing a good job compared to the toothbrush right next to it, which was, like, you know, Colgate, regular Walgreens. Saying. Yeah, just total 100%, no enough. way to recycle it. Um. And I, 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 I found, I was like, well, why is it that the people that try are like getting the most grief in some way in my mind? And so I'm curious if you guys have like ever thought about working outside of the bounds of these plastic works that if anyone's ever been like, oh, well, this one, you know, has anyone ever judged you guys or get, had a comment about how certain ones aren't as environmentally friendly as it could have been or something like that? I no okay good <laughs> you guys don't have anyone judging you that's good and, and nor should you <laughs> no no in our face anyway okay good <laughs> and maybe that's different in, in the art world you know because art like i feel like if you do even remotely a little bit of used recycled found materials that like i feel like that goes so much further than like a consumer product and i i'm so super excited to have this recycled luxurious toothbrush but I found my instinct said to give myself trouble and this company trouble for some reason for even trying almost because mm. it wasn't a hundred percent, you know. And I, I, I think it's nope. something we all have to deal with as as individuals with these these plastics. The beginning we tried to make the stroke, the black stroke, out of uh, the black big plastic bags, but it didn't work out. So that's why mm. we ended up doing it, was... it with paper. That was a crazy idea that I wish it had worked because it would have been so beautiful. Imagine this. So you know how we have the black stroke that is a paper? Yeah. So the original idea is imagine we take a, one of those big, heavy-duty, black garbage bags. Yeah. And we cut it, and then we glue the plastic. We sandwich the plastic between the two. And then so the piece will be a garbage bag that will hang with these images mm. in it. You, yeah. Do you follow? Wow. Yes. But it, it was so difficult absolutely. to like. It was absolutely impossible. Like <laughs> the flat plastic was so hard to like cut and and glue. It was just impossible. Yeah, we tried. So and it, it wasn't gonna happen. To yeah. Find a glue that will glue plastics together. That it's not a hot gun. It's kind of difficult. Mm. I see. Absolutely. But, yeah. But we're also very we're also very hard on ourselves and on being like as low carbon footprint as we can. Like for us, like you see that piece in GCAT, it's beautiful, we love it. Every time we go and we see it, we like love, we love everybody from GCAT. So it's like so good to have that piece there. But it's really painful for us to have to use two pieces of plexiglass yeah. mm. in order to have this piece. So that kind of defeats the whole effort, you know? And, and we just don't have another alternative. That's just the way it is, but it is mm -hmm. in a way painful. Yeah. Uh, Rock Hero, thanks for the follow. Yeah, thanks for following us today. Um, and, and yeah, because plexiglass is, is acrylic. It's clear acrylic, so it's it's made out of plastic, right? Um, so the, And then, you know, you wouldn't want... It gets scratched so easily, you wouldn't want to source that from, you know, a, a scrap pile or, or anything like that, right? So it, 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 does, it does create some of those issues. Um, Skate Mom has a, a question here. Uh, and the question is, do you think the most important part of your art is the beauty of it or the message? Or maybe you can just tell us kind of how you see the proportion of the product of the creative practice uh, compared to actually like the act of the creative practice. Well, I think the way I see it is I think the beauty is what we're searching for and the material that we use just give it integrity, you know. Mm. 
So it's like, but basically like, I mean, I feel like our search is for beauty, like we're searching for beauty and we're just using this because this is what makes us feel that we're doing something on the side, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that beauty mm -hmm. is what wants to bring people closer to see what it is made out of and find out what is it. Yeah, luring it's things. luring them in. Yeah, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and it's, it's just, again, funny to me, like, you know, we're, we're giving ourselves grief on, you know, it's like you guys are like, oh, we had to use plexiglass, I know, where, like, so many artists wouldn't even think twice to use plexiglass, and they wouldn't even think about the acrylic, and, like, so I feel like that, like, you know, the, the beauty that you guys are seeking out and through the materiality that there is still that, like, we do the best that we can, and I think that's ultimately all we can do, you know, because, Rick, I think, like, what you're talking about. Well, I think like, that happens when you're already in when right. you're already doing something like to zero carbon footprint in the yeah. making of your artwork, anything can mess that up. Well, right. if you're not worrying at all, what can go wrong? You know what I mean? It's yeah. Like yeah. If, if you're from <laughs> totally. Well, and, and it's like a creative, a limitation I think is, is really beautiful too. Cause I think people uh, kind of desire that a little bit and also maybe should seek that out to be like, well, for this piece, I actually do want to try to be as like limited as possible and try to only use materials that I, I feel like I'm I'm uh, can gather from other spaces and I don't need to go out and purchase, you know, and and like Rick, like you're saying with your spray gun, you know, just using compressed air or, or something like that. It's just like oftentimes there's so many little tweaks that people can do, you know, while still remembering that there is so little we can do as individuals in some ways when. There are massive companies that are <laughs> giant factories that are causing the vast majority of, of, you know, climate change that, you know, this idea that we need to give ourselves grief at all, you know, because it is important. It is up to us, you know, you know, uh, is, wait, who is the bear in the in the forest with the fire? Rick? Smokey. Smokey. <laughs> Yeah, I, <laughs> smoky bear like smoky the bear and only you can prevent forest fires it's like that's true but also like you know so is de deforestation can not cause forest fires you know so it's like only you can recycle your plastic bottle but yeah but also maybe the cransbergs can stop doing <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna stop there but yeah. um it's just really important to that individual value versus the group whole and what you guys do with your work is just so striking. I mean, I just, I, it stirs up so much conversation. It does return to that idea of integrity. And, and I, I, I thought that that was well put, you know, know, like the, the work does, I think, I think for artists as they, as they move on, the integrity of their work does drive a lot of the decisions that they, they make about it. And without that integrity, it's, it's difficult to even have a body of work. I think that the body of work, the pursuit of beauty might be there, but the body of work doesn't form until um, there's integrity in the practice. And that looks different for everybody. Um, you know, for, so for me, in, in terms of the spray gun, like the spray gun is actually a movement towards integrity in, in multiple ways. It's first, it's, it's more healthy, um, but also like that comes from the history and the lineage of my, my dad painting cars with the with the spray gun so like there's like multiple levels of these integrities that can come into the practice but you know we we do have to make compromises you know like the question becomes do you show it at, at kranzberg you know like having having to know know this knowledge then a part of the ways that we generate integrity in our practice is through choosing to do certain things but most often choosing not to do other things um, and that's, that's just as we, as we continue to receive more information, uh, those, those choices become more important. Those choices are really, are really kind of the, the foundation of the work. But I, I guess, does anything else come up for you when you think about the integrity of your work? Because, uh, it felt like you had a, a good grasp on what that, what that meant to you, um, the, the integrity. But I think this is the thing, like, you know how I told you the search for beauty is like what we do as an artist. Mm -hmm. But then we also needed to have like something that would really give purpose to that, to that search of beauty was yeah. to have either the 
right material or the right message or the right subject matter. You know what I mean? So because we had like, the, as soon as we found the right material, we're like, okay, we already have this material, which is already speaks on its, by itself on like the message that we want to give. Then we can now search for beauty freely because we already have this other aspect going for the work that mm -hmm. is powerful mm -hmm. enough, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I was very clear. No, no. absolutely. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's letting it sit. Soaking it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, well, and I, I think the integrity of work, too, you know, integrity can mean so many different things, I think, for people. Like, I, I need this to wholly be my, my thought. My, my, my art needs to be one-to-one -one with how I feel about it. You know that I didn't so I didn't put away any creative motive that I had for this work, even though you may still take in some criticism, may take in some helpful tips or something. That I I think a lot of people tend to wrestle with that in so many different ways. So I think you guys using integrity as the material itself too, I think, and thinking about it in the physical material way of that, I think is really interesting. Beyond just like I need my piece to come across in this way. And that translates to the, your guys' material that you use. I also would like to say that, I mean, not to discourage anybody, that art doesn't have to be for others, you know. Mm. Art can just be mm. for yourself. Art can be a very therapeutic thing, you know what I mean? And for some people, art can be a great outlet for, like, terrible things that are within their lives. And so even if art is very personal or anecdotic, it can still be very powerful and it can still resonate to so many other people that might be going through the same thing. You know what I mean? So, so there's always value in art because it's something that you do so intuitive and so out of spike that spite that no matter what it is, it's got a beauty of it because you're doing it in an intuitive way. And everything that comes from intuition is, is just, it's just like what needs to be done. You know what I mean? And it's what like, something else is telling you that that is the path that you should follow and it's there for a reason you know yeah thanks for sharing absolutely greg greg stevens is clap clapping you in the chat here <laughs> <laughs> lots of clapping. Yeah, i was gonna say rick just before the break it looks like we got four minutes till then like i don't even know what i can say better than that so <laughs> yeah yeah we we did have a question from denise and we can okay, we can probably me. end here um love the idea of applying the technique to animal subjects really makes the connection so clearly any thoughts on expanding to human figures somebody needs you needs to hook you up with greenpeace and all the environmental groups love your work please <laughs> <laughs> we actually have thought of that and we just did an application for this um call for artists and we are doing some of it with human some bodies human wow. bodies okay because part of it is like look there's so many, like nature is so wonderful. You know, when you when you study and when you try to understand like just the organism, the body, everything that goes with it. Look at human technology, everything that has been developed and created. And humans cannot make what a liver can do. Mm -hmm. No matter how much, like the, a simple function, like a liver or there's different parts of the, the only body part that the humans can emulate is the heart because all it does is it pumps mm -hmm. and that's the only thing that humans have been able to figure it out all the other organs no matter how much technology we have they don't know they don't know how to do it they can know you know they can make an iphone but they cannot make a liver you know <laughs> <laughs> wow and yeah, so there, so 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 it's, there's so much wonderness in in nature and that's all that's what we want to to celebrate and and all oh, the right word. You're doing it. <laughs> You're doing I all of those things. Part, yeah, you've got it. It's yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, great. Thanks, Denise, for the question. Skate Mom, I see your question. Uh, let's hold that off until the other side of the break. And I think that's going to give us uh, a good end to uh, the rest of the art making conversation. So I'm going to drop their links in the chat, um, Instagram and the websites so across the break if you want to go follow them on instagram or go check out their websites you can do it and one second 
so yeah enjoying it so far i um appreciate you all for bringing up uh comments and um you know generating some knowledge for all of us about some things that are happening in the the art world here in st louis um we are going to take a 10 minute break we're going to come back and then we're going to round off our art conversation and finish the show by asking kelly and alejandro some uh some like popular 10 popular culture questions at the end that are it's going to be a lot of fun so get your questions in now you can send them over the break and um, we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about their collaboration and we will see you soon hello hello welcome welcome back thank you for hanging out across the break uh we are in our final hour now and we during this part of the show we're going to talk about the uh we're going to wrap up the art conversation and then we're going to get into the 10 questions um thanks again for everyone tuning in today if you've been enjoying the stream if this is your first time here welcome feel free to chat ask questions you won't interrupt me i'll just filter them into our guests whenever they feel good i'm going to go back to our group here again with a new special guest gato <laughs> Uh, oh, it's good to have the kitty on the phone. Yes, cat cam is what we we all are are kind of built on. Uh, they are the stars of the show. Yeah, I really got to get a cat. Rick, you've got a cat. Our guests often have a cat. I never have a cat. I got to get one. Maybe to help add to the. <laughs> you could get like show. a like a cat, like a stuffed animal cat or something, <laughs> and that's yeah. just the joke. You'd be like, oh, look, look who's here. Oh, look at you. Okay, thanks. If you could give, if you could give your love to a cat, I'm sure a cat would appreciate it, Jake. Yes, I, I've been toying with the idea of getting a cat for like two or three years now, and I, I think it's steadily approaching the time to, to go ahead and do it soon. So. A mystical companion. So you're into astrology and stuff like that. It could yes. be like a great... I, I completely agree. I, I you know, uh, a, a former partner of mine got a cat, and I always thought I was allergic to them. And she's like, I'm getting a cat, and I don't care if you're allergic. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and then I found out that I'm, like, certainly not as, as allergic as I thought. But, like, I had to learn the language of cats. And oh, I, yeah. didn't, I didn't understand, like, how to pet a cat. Because I was like, dogs just – dogs love everything. You know, mm -hmm. I know dogs. I grew up with a dog. But, like, no, You cats, have to be an expert. You have to yeah. be an expert, otherwise they're going to hate you. Right? Yes, or hurt you. <laughs> And luckily, the cat that she got was was very much like a dog, so it was very I could ease into the cat language mm -hmm. and and the ways that cats uh, want to be loved and and cared for. So I I feel like I've I'm I'm slowly learning, and I, I anytime anytime I meet a cat, I'm like, okay, what's your deal? Yeah, and I really try to focus in. It's it's a very mystical thing. I completely agree. You got along with Virgil pretty well, my cat. I do. Yeah, Rick's cat Virgil is very sweet. He seems busy. He seems like he's a busy cat. He's always doing something. He's he goes from thing to thing. He's mostly just trying to convince us to give him more food. He is losing weight. He's lost a pound in the past okay. couple of months, which is a big deal for a cat. That's very is good. What's that? Strict. Is he on a strict diet or something? He we he, things got a little out of control. Yeah, we yeah things got a little out of hand. We had this uh, automatic pet feeder that was. Mm uh kind of broke and then was like feeding him too much and we mm -hmm. kind of knew it but we thought that maybe he would just self-regulate and uh he didn't yeah okay. yeah he... is that, is that <laughs> one of those that you can activate it from your phone or something it was but then it broke like the company went under when uh when the coronavirus stuff started happening they like ran out of money and then like the app didn't work anymore and it's it's this this whole thing. So I blame them. I'm suing them for him getting fat. <laughs> My sweet boy, what have you done to him? Damn you, pet net. <laughs> pet net. We're coming for you next. <laughs> um, previous to the break, we had a question from Skate Mom that says, and I think it's a really good place for us to start the kind of like final 20 or 30 minutes of our art conversation here. Um, the question is, when making the work, how does your collaborative process work? Well, we're constantly talking about like different ways of like what we're planning to do. And then when we come like in agreement into a subject, we start like designing both of us in Photoshop or Illustrator. 
and then we just come back together and we start like looking at the images and see what works best and getting feedback from one another and for me it's like really great to get feedback from him because when i met him i was like so impressed with what what he was doing so it's mm -hmm. actually very inspiring so you want to add That's sweet. <laughs> so yeah i mean i guess we just we i mean this is what we talk about all day every day <laughs> <laughs> what can we do what is it like i mean it's just a constant conversation and we design on our own like based on these conversations we have each of us just come up with designs mm. and then we approve them or not like together and then once the design is approved the work is very just labor-based it's nothing it's just like cut and pay and, and, and glue so we both work together but it's just it's just labor you know once we we, we decided on a design it's pretty much just labor so and it's i mean we always enjoy going to the studio we're very fortunate we have a studio in the same building where we live we live in an artist love here in in, in downtown yeah and yeah. so we go there we listen to different podcasts or music and just work away you know I think it's interesting that you said that you do the design process separately and then come back. Um, it's uh, Generally, I think it's really important for people in relationships and uh, romantic relationships, but also working relationships to have time away from each other, to have space to like make. And there's something about designing in particular, because I worked as a graphic designer and uh, for for a period you know, f like my first career was that. And like when somebody is standing over your shoulder as you're designing a logo, it's impossible. Because <laughs> you don't want immediate feedback. You want feedback when you already work so much. You know, when you like, you already did this, okay, give me feedback. Mm -hmm. But don't give me feedback mm -hmm. on every single move I made because then you're like keeping me from flowing, you know? Right. Right. Which translates to that, to the like, the you know, the sharing space relationship to the, to the intimate relationship too. So <laughs> I, I, I know like I need to get worked, worked up sometimes to like, you know, it takes me some time to get going on a certain project or, or if there's, if there's uh oftentimes if there's scrutiny, like you said, too early in the practice, it can so totally disrupt my flow. Even if that's like cleaning the bathroom, you know, or <laughs> even if that's like organizing a, a shelf, it's like, first of all, I need to just, start um so it's really cool that you all have yeah. that established in in your practice that like okay time away is important and on the, on that same theme you you mentioned that this is what you talk about all day and night but like do you have a practice of instituting breaks or buffers yeah. between you know so so that there's there's time where you're not thinking about a particular aspect of the work and and you decide to to be in another space with one another. Well, I don't think it's established, you know, yeah. because we enjoy it a lot. It's not like, yeah. oh, you're talking about that, but I want to relax. No, for us, it is relaxing, you know, and it is fun. Good. And it is something that we really, we really like and we really enjoy. So it's not like, oh, but all you do is just think about work all day long. You know what I mean? Because it doesn't feel that way. And maybe if it did, then we started thinking about doing something else, you know? Mm. Even when we go, I don't know, like to the botanical garden and we see a window and we're like, oh, look at that window. Like this window will be perfect if we make a cat, like whatever for uh -huh. it out of single use plastic. We just have it so embedded. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's amazing to challenge those notions of how we think that we should structure your life because uh, conventional society would say you should have time where you talk about work and then you should have time where you don't. Right. But like that doesn't quite apply when the work is your life. And I, I find often for myself, I have to confront those like societal norms or habits that say, hey, you're working too much. But like when my work is painting and when my work is, uh, you know, being on screen with, you know, three of my friends, it's like it's not the same thing. And like continuing to challenge those like societal notions of what it means to be an artist or what it means to be productive I think is is a a really valid pursuit. So I, I I I that's kind of what I hear when you're saying that is like 
it's not work and like we we do it as long as it feels good and then maybe if it stops feeling good we don't do it as much feels good <laughs> i think th i think that's like it's a powerful way to be instead of attaching it to a number of hours or attaching it to an, a number of of works in a given period i agree well and and rick it's interesting you say that because i you know i i kind of feel like how much of that is like americanized like that we at some point anytime we put effort into something we call it work maybe even if it's something we love and that like you know that we still maybe sometimes put those limits on ourselves where it's like well there's work and then there's play because that's like i feel like a very american thing to be like you have to work nine to five and then once it starts the stroke of five it's happy hour i mean our show is called art brunch for gosh sakes like it's like literally this idea of like institutionalized time at this certain space that we enjoy one another <laughs> but brunch only goes to a certain point and then it's back to work you know or like sun the rest of sunday we have off but then monday we go back to work and what i what i love about what you guys kelly and alejandro are talking about like you know you guys are just like this is just all the time now i imagine there is some dishes doing <laughs> you know you got to do sometimes you just got to do some work but um i just think like i i wonder you know like like alejandro you came here you you came to to florida around when you were 18 i believe and kelly i think yours you said you were like around nine or you much younger um i'm just curious if like you know, i'm sorry i was like 13 when i moved oh here. 13 okay gotcha like i'm just curious like is has like the um, I, you know you've been here clearly for a long time but like is there like the americanized way of looking at the pursuit of making art has has that ever been something you've bumped up against well actually I feel like in United States, artists are taken way more serious than they are in South America. Really? From society, not from like institutions or galleries or, or museums or anything like that. But I'm saying like from just regular society, I feel like if you're an artist in South America, a lot of times you're seen as a lazy person that you just don't want to work. You just want to like be this creative entity that is not question or is and it's not it's like it doesn't really assimilate society because it doesn't have like a regular job hmm. while in united states i feel like i mean it's my personal my personal experience is that yeah. i feel like artists there's more room for artists to make money there's more room for artists to get recognition from society there is more room for artists to just like develop their career in general yeah because i i do feel like it it carries a lot of social weight to be an artist like if you find out of somebody that you know or a friend of a friend is an artist i do feel like at least me personally i'm like Ooh, who, who are they what do they do like you know i i have that social interest in that but i i guess i and we've talked about rick i feel like we've talked about this and we don't have to go fully into this but like previous people on the show have talked about how little institutionally our country has cared about this you know that all of us together have experienced this america where like you said like from institutions we get no money we always have to be fighting for ourselves to be fighting to be an artist but i guess there are more options for artists to be paid perhaps than other spaces and and at least socially we can feel like well i know i carry value because we we carry value as artists and america views us as interesting cool we like that you know those 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 places to do that um but i guess i guess it's just there is no perfect place certainly either uh to be uh, to be an artist to be fully respected to be fully funded you know to kind of have to always be fighting against this work play environment I feel that i made a decision early in my career that it was going to be so difficult to be so to like have like a sustainable life out of my art so i decided to find a job that was a that i like enough to like no to like not take away a lot from me mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. i work at uh, at museums you know and i help hang installations and that also keeps me in the loop of of what's going on in these big institutions, how like the whole protocol around this art that is so highly valued, you know, and all those things are really like really uh, add up to what I want to be and what I like in life, you know. Alejandro is the happiest art handler in St. Louis. <laughs> I think I think that's the case. I think I am like so jaded sometimes from my art handling experience that i feel like well, a grumpy old man <laughs> what's that i am part-time 
Yeah, so. that's probably. <laughs> <laughs> that might help. <laughs> that job can shoot you up. That job can get to people. I've seen I've seen it get to people. Um, but it is also like such an amazing crux of all of those things is like, oh, I can be around art and get paid for it. Uh, sounds kind of inconceivable to <laughs> to me, or it did at certain points in my life. Like, um, so that's that's good. That's so fun. Um, well, and it's it's beautiful too that you guys can bring that space together, not only just as creative partners, but as romantic partners and as people that can form a home and you guys still have the space of just like to make art is to enjoy life, you know? And I think that a lot of people struggle with that. And um, I mean, I certainly have, you know, I, on my own, Rick, I, as I imagine you have too. And, um, you know, Rick, I like to think of our creative partnership. You yeah. know, I feel like I've, I've, you and I, I think have, <laughs> as the other couple on the screen, um, <laughs> Rick and I, you and I uh, as creative partners have been like, I really enjoyed it. You know, let's let's pull back the curtains here a little bit. I I think it's it's something that like I have found very few people like Rick that I could work with that I feel such a uh, creative freedom, but also a kind of um, similar ethic and way of looking at the world. And it, it, it's like so when you guys talk about your ability to work together, since you guys just kind of get it, I I wonder if I was on the show with a different person, I wouldn't be able to understand it as well because Rick here is someone that I feel I'm like oh I get it. They work together well because me and Rick work together well. <laughs> and That's to sweet. Rick's partner, Tiffany, I'm not trying to get in here. I'm not trying to steal Rick or anything. It's not Mr. Steal Your Man over here, but all I'm saying is I, I think it's that's something I've recently experienced where I feel like I can actually have true, wonderful, co creative partnership and collaboration because I, I, it's something I've certainly struggled with as, as an artist, as a co-collaborator. I think working with other people like fundamentally sucks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I I don't know. Like maybe yeah. I I'm alone in that and and I don't mean mm -hmm. it in a way that like makes me would make anybody who really works with me, me. I get it. <laughs> How do you feel about me, bro? Okay. I just think I just think it's like I just think it's part of the deal. And and I think that it's difficult because it is so easy to imagine yourself as like this island and to make the mm -hmm. decisions that you feel like you need to make. And the moment that you open yourself up to the uh, you open yourself up to another person where something they do or something they think affects your life and can even affect kind of like the deeper fabric of your being uh exactly. that's like conflict city like that's that's like the heart of anything good kind of comes from there um but but yeah i think i think that it does like i mean i i of course like enjoy all of these relationships in my life and for me, it, it works because I come at it from a place of like, I'm going to have to sacrifice. Like from the, from the very beginning of any time I institute a relationship, it's like if I want to have a relationship with this person, there are going to be compromises and there are going to be sacrifices and it is going to suck. So if you don't want to do that with that person, then like you shouldn't. If <laughs> and I want to do that with you, Jake. I want, I want oh. all the suck. Me too. I want yeah. all the hurt, all the pain, all the our beautiful dark twisted fantasies, everything. We'll make it happen. We're gonna because <laughs> you get you get into that, you know, you get yeah. into that, and um, especially working on on something like so important to you, like your artwork is. Is it like there are are disagreements? Do you do you guys have disagreements, or am I just projecting? <laughs> I mean, we we are we don't agree on everything. Uh huh. So of course there's like somebody comes up with an idea and and the other person's reaction just tell, says it all. <laughs> it's a very very political. Do you guys have disagreements? <laughs> well, we don't agree on everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's very bipartisan, but we try to reach across the aisle. Yes. But yeah. Not that we have disagreements. Is that we just can we just cannot agree on everything. That's great. Right. I love That's it. That's really true. That's extremely true. And and it, and it can be, you know, you get tied up in that. So when you present something and, and it doesn't hit home, like if we're too attached to what we're doing, if we're too attached to kind of these ideas about how things should be or are or should be perceived, then it, and it creates issues. But the way that I'm hearing you talk about that and, and some of the other things that I know about you as you two is, is that kind of like 
your attachments to the, these ideas are looser, maybe, and that that's kind of a a lubricant or are helpful when you get into those places. I also feel that because we don't have that much formal education, we have way more freedom, you know. Mm -hmm. Because we haven't been taught about so many boundaries of art and so many like technicalities. So I, I feel like we're not as stuck with those because we just don't have that in our system, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just something. Well, and Rick, I, I mean, I feel like you've talked about that a lot. As it's far a joke. As, yeah. I art mean, school's a joke. <laughs> art school's a joke. That's the way Rick feels about it. But, you know, it's <laughs> you a know? good joke. It's a, It's like, <laughs> it's totally... I love I love the comedy of it and and people that engage in that I have I have tons and tons of respect for but in my life it 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 didn't work in my life it it just wasn't it wasn't right for me <laughs> but yeah but I I think there is something to the the informalization of art making and I think um that can be a strength and and a a detriment to some people's art but I I genuinely think for your guys's work I think it makes a lot of sense and it, it's beautiful what, what comes out of it having not having to have that institutionalized mindset because i think that's the worst part is it institutionalizes your mind at some point because you think well i have to be part of this narrative um and and then how can i just like slightly do a three percent tweak off the narrative so everyone will think what i do is cool but i'm deeply in on this other thing um I also didn't go to art school, so I, I feel you as well. <laughs> I didn't go at all, so I, 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 I got a media degree instead, which that's a, that's why I'm here on, on, on TV instead, so it makes a lot of sense. I'm using my degree right now, <laughs> more than I ever have, actually. So <laughs> You're trained for this. Trained for it, exactly. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's, that's the nature of education, is education, um, to a certain degree, inside of our society has to follow certain metrics for it to be valid and and that's that's kind of like the fun thing from my experiences pre dropping out of art school is that like yes we know all of these things are important but then also simultaneously we're all engaged in this idea that this is like a farce and and that like you can't teach creativity but you can like cultivate it um but institutions have a hard time you know they they struggle with cultivation uh and it's and it's nice to find other people who you know are open to just looking at the world around them and finding the materials that work for them creating reasons and then making making from those things as well i think it takes all types well i think we're kind of in this place now where we go to the final 10 questions as we we get up get up to uh, 1230 here. Do you agree, Jake? I sure do. Let's do it. 